Then I headed for New York, and I was ready to go into the big time, and I conned two buddies of mine into coming to New York, and I told them Paul Whiteman was a very dear friend of mine, and I'd never seen Paul Whiteman in person, but I didn't tell them that. I says, he and I are like that. So we ended up in New York at the Chesterfield Hotel. He said, you gonna call your buddy? And I says, okay. And it was Chet Atkins' brother, Jimmy, and Ernie Newton. And they were standing by the phone and watching me call Paul Whiteman. And I call Paul on the phone. I got his secretary. And uh, she says, we're not interested in any talent. And hung up. So the two guys in the trio said to me, uh, what'd they say, Red? And I said, he says, come right over. So we went to 53rd and Broadway. and. Uh, didn't even have cases for our instruments. And we, we just went up to the floor and uh, cut it short. Uh, we got a door slammed in our face and we're standing in the hallway and my two buddies said to me, I thought you knew Paul real well. And I says, well, you know, they're funny in New York. Uh, you have to get used to them. So I said, when the time is right, uh, he'll come around to us. And we're standing there and sure enough, there's Fred Waring. And I said, are you Fred Waring? And he says, yes. But he says, I'm not looking for any talent. And I says, well, you're, the, the elevator's on the ground floor. What have you got to lose if you listen to us? And he says, all right, go ahead, play something. We played something, he cracked up. He says, if they like you as good as I do, I'll hire you. And we got the job with Fred Waring. So we were very lucky. <laughs> Fred Waring, coast to coast, five nights a week, playing all the largest theaters. I never forget one personal appearance we made at the Strand Theater, and Fred says, how do you want to be introduced? I says, well, just put your hand out like that and say, here's a Les Paul trail. And I says, we'll go get him. So he says, that's what you want? OK. So he did. And we went out there and died on Broadway. After the show, I knock on the door, and Fred says, come in, Les. I says, how'd you know it was me? He says, oh, I know it was you. He says, you want to know what you did wrong, huh? And I says, yes, sir, I do. And he says, well, I'll tell you what you do. He says, next show, you sit up there in the band with all the other people, and he says, and when I call for you, you stumble through the music racks and knock a, knock a few things over and work your way up to the front, and he says, you'll stop the show. And he was right, we did. Sit down. Wait a minute. Don't I know you? Aren't you Wingy Manone? Sure, just the greatest trumpet player in the world. Oh, I wouldn't say the world. I'm a little modest about them things, just a country thing. <laughs> <laughs> now I want you to meet a bunch of country boys that you might know. There's Candy Candino. Hi. Hi Candy. Uh, how do, how do. There's Jess Stacy, piano player. Hi, Hi Jess. Joe Toto Venuti. What Hi, you know, Joe. Joe? And back here is a hip cat, Abe Lyman. Hey. Hi, Hi, Hi gang. And over there, Les Paul. Hi, Les. Hi, gang. And uh, our gobstick man, Jerry Wall. <laughs> Hello, Jerry. Hello. Hey, Freddie, I got a great idea. We need a band for the show, right? Yeah. Well, why don't we ask the fellas? No, no, I don't. No, no. Well, wait a minute. What's the deal? When's it coming off? Friday night. Friday night? Man, Friday night's a drag night. We're only going to be in town for three days. Came out to Hollywood to make a picture. Well, if you're supposed to be out in Hollywood making a picture, what are you doing way down here in San Juan? This is the only place we could find a room. <laughs> <laughs> he just came in time for a little session we was getting ready to play. Go ahead, Paul, knock us off a little bit.
Tonight's profile of Les Paul, the Wizard of Waukesha, continues on Night Flight right after this. Playing what I have here on my guitar. It's an invention of mine, this little black box. It's called the Les Pulverizer. And, uh, listen, you can laugh all you want, but Radio Shack and Sears Rover are trying to get a hang of this thing. They'd like to have this little box, this little black box of mine. It's my invention. With it, I can take and multiply my guitar into an orchestra. Okay, now here we go. That's one guitar, regular, simple, dumb little riff with one guitar. I'll play that back for you. Okay. That's pretty fast, isn't it? Okay. Now what I'll do is I'll add a bass part to that, and then you'll hear two guitars. Now this is adding a bass to the part you just heard. Where do we get going? Now that's three guitars. I figured that out all by myself. All right, now I'll try another one. Put the drummer out of it. Kidding. Come on in and join me, Electronics, uh, I didn't have any formal background at all. I uh, just went to the library. I studied, uh, I studied electricity in school, but I surrounded myself with uh, the talent in Milwaukee. If an uh, engineer uh, was running the equipment, I went to the transmitter to find out what a transmitter was and, and how to build one and uh, all, all what an equalizer was, what a filter was, etc., what impedance was. And, like my drummer calls it, impedience. Uh, it didn't take long before uh, I was hooked on electronics, and they wed together so so wonderfully that today, the young generation, I don't think you can find a guitar player that isn't into, or a musician for that fact, that isn't into electronics in some form because it, he's got to record it. To record it, he's got to know what a microphone is, whether it's high or low impedance, he's got to know what, what he's doing with synthesizers and uh, all the funny boxes that are hooked in between the guitar and the amplifier. A fellow has to be somewhat uh, knowledgeable in the electronic industry.